and we're rolling. My name is Mick Hayes. That's Mick like Mick Jagger and Hayes like Isaac Hayes. I am the internet's most invisible guitarist and singer, a man who hesitates to call himself a songwriter because I've met some songwriters and what I do is very different. I write songs to get things off my chest. And as they say, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Today we're dealing with the topic of loss, which is a very sensitive topic to all of us, but it's extremely sensitive to me uh, because I just went through it and received some very bad news late last week, which is why there's been a delay in my communications. But thank you to those of you that have encouraged me to kind of get back up on the horse here and ride. Now, I've been dealing with loss my entire life, as I'm sure that you have, and the only difference between us could be in the handful of stories that I'm about to share with you. However, any of those differences really don't make us any different at all. First, I'd like to say that I was an altar boy at the earliest age possible and had a tremendous experience at the Our Lady of Victory Basilica, which is a very well-known uh, church in the uh, western part of New York where I'm from. Now, that experience gave me a respect and a reverence for death very early on, as well as an understanding of what death can do to a family. Now, my first and closest experience with it came in 1992 at the age of 14 when my grandfather passed away on my dad's side. Now, just a footnote, uh, I mentioned in previous episodes that we saw my grandparents as part of visitation rites every Saturday, just about. And when my dad would kind of, well, <laughs> I'll just say it, he would pass out basically from the night before, uh, my papa, which is what I called him, would kind of wave me into his den. He had a music den, which was a former bedroom converted just for listening to music. And he would spin old records for me. Some of my fondest memories. And truly, that is where the obsession actually begins for me. I can remember, like, the curtains moving when the needle hit the groove. It was it was a really special moment that um, I, I, would, I would love to kind of you know, never forget. But not only that, I would love to, you know, kind of turn other people on to music the same way. But most people just, you know, pass their phone around and go here, listen to this new artist. <laughs> he says, as he rolls his eyes, nobody can see you though. Um, but anyways, unfortunately when he did pass, uh, he was very young and it was, uh, as I said, 1992, I was 14. And I remember I was allowed to pick his records or pick from his collection. And uh, I wanted them all, but they wouldn't let me have them. Which has kind of bothered me my entire life because not only have my tastes change, but at that age, I only knew how to pick things based on how they look. And, and if I remembered him playing that one for me. But... Aside from the traditional family viewing of the body, which is just so treacherous, I still don't know why that is a thing, but I've made it very clear to my wife that if anything should ever happen to me, I don't want that done. I don't want anybody to go through that. But I really didn't grasp it. I knew through everything that I'd been through from being an altar boy and being uh, young in my faith at that time, that I knew that he was somewhere else. He was just not here. And to be perfectly honest, I was okay with that because even my adolescent idea of here, air quotes, hasn't really been good enough for me, even at that age. So that was when I was 14. And then when I was 16, in the summer of 19, well, I was 16 turning 17. It was 1995. I was invited to a house party. And of course I went. And it was the typical parents are out of town, pool party, loud music, a lot of fun. Uh, but as the night wore on, uh, none of us could cook. And uh, the usual spot was Denny's. You know, go sit in the smoking lounge. You're already there in your mind with me, I assure you. 
and uh, sitting in the smoking lounge with your your buddies at 16 was the cool thing to do. So we all decided to go to Denny's, which was a whole town away uh, from where I grew up. But a couple of people had had a little too much to drink and it wasn't safe for them to drive. Um, I was one of those not going to be driving people and uh, hitched a ride with a sober person. We were very um, responsible, I'll say, even at that age. But uh, again, f a family car now, <clears throat> bragging rights. I had my own car back then, but still a family car had to go back uh, to, to, uh, to their house. So um, a bunch of kids, I call them kids, but they, we were all kids, took that car back home. And uh, they were going to meet us at Denny's. Well, we got to Denny's and they never showed up. And uh, we found out uh, very, very early the next day that um, they were basically on their way back from dropping off that car and encountered another high school friend somewhere at a corner or a stop sign or whatever, whatever it happened. And then they decided to start kind of playing tag on the street with their cars, you know, more or less like who can get in front of the other one. I don't know if that's called tag. I'm sorry. I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but they just started getting in front of one another. And eventually one of the cars lost control and, uh, that car ended up in the ditch uh, on the side of the road and a young girl that was in the back seat in the middle position uh, was thrown from the car and unfortunately she was in critical condition the very next day and mind you we're all sitting at Denny's thinking we got blown off by our friends there's no cell phones there's no nothing there's literally pay phones how are you going to get a hold of somebody at a pay phone if they're not at home things that we take for granted today for sure. Um, but as I said, we found out the next day what had happened. Uh, that is kind of sat as a horror story uh, through my entire life. And I know it kind of hovers over the, uh, the kids at the high school uh, that I, uh, you know, for many years after, I guess the best way to say it. And the only thing I haven't told you is that girl was my girlfriend. And as I said, she was in critical condition. Um, she had a number of injuries, uh, including neck injuries, broken neck, spine stuff. Um, and in the process of all that, either she developed or they had found for the first time that she also had a heart condition. She had to wear, I guess it's hard to even say wear, but she had a, a halo. And I know you know what that is, but basically they took her beautiful face, which was already scarred and uh, cut up and bruised and such. And they drilled screws through her temple and, well, not through her temple, but through the top of her head. And she had to wear this halo just to keep her mobile or immobilized, excuse me. And there's probably far better medical definitions than this, but really what I'm trying to get across is my emotion and point, which I'm coming to, I promise. So as we returned to high school and her condition improved, uh, those of us who were close were, with her were able to visit her in the hospital and emotions were very high. The beginning of junior year was not not quite the same. And I'll remind you, like I've told you in episodes before, my graduating class was under, I believe, under 140. So it was a very tight-knit community and everybody kind of knew about what happened. And the day that they said that she was able to come back to school I knew was going to be very difficult for her because she was a very, very beautiful girl. And unfortunately, a lot of her beauty was just robbed from her in this accident. Um, didn't change the way I felt about her because the things that we, the time that we had spent together beforehand go back for 
much longer than that. We had grown pretty great roots. In one of the areas where we really bonded and talking on the cell phone or cell phone on the uh, house phone for that matter late at night was uh, her parents were were probably at that time setting up for divorce. They were fighting a lot and being from a divorced home, uh, for some reason, she really kind of felt drawn to me. In East Aurora, New York, at that time, that was not a common thing at all. Most of the families were, you know, two-parented homes, and I was from a single-family home. It was completely different. And she was eventually going to be in that same in that same position, that same boat. So we bonded a lot on that. And I would write songs for her and poems to her, and she would write to me, and all the stuff that teenagers do. It was really, really special, if you ask me today, especially and innocent for that matter. But what's crazy is here she is back at school dealing with how she feels everyone's looking at her while she's still wearing this giant black halo with, you know, ointment on her screws and knowing that she's going to have scars on her face for the rest of her life. It was really hard for her. And then eventually her parents separated and her mom moved to the next school district. And what had happened at that time was that somehow she was able to attend school, but she had to get dropped off at her mom's house in the next school district while her parents were in the process of, again, separation, divorce, not really remembering exactly the legal aspect of it. But I drove her home a number of days, if not every day, I really can't remember that well, from school, as long as my car was reliable. <laughs> I say that kind of because, you know, that was another issue then, but still, I would drive her home from school every day. And unfortunately, one day I dropped her off and she was being her normal self. And what they told me was she went in the house and took a whole bottle of her heart medication from her new heart, <clears throat> excuse me, her new heart condition. And I've heard the story told two ways that she just laid on the couch and, uh, and that was it. And I have also heard that she laid next to her mother and that was it. I don't know what story is the truth. To tell you the truth, I still don't know if I want to know. But I can tell you that I was one of the last people to, at that point, in my opinion, love and care for her and accept her for what, what had ever happened. And that was the hardest thing I ever had to go through at. Again, 17. It was barely 17. I'm sorry, I literally had to stop recording. But um, I think where a good place to pick up is that she was laid to rest on December 14th in 1995. Sadly, long before social media, there's no photo to pull up of her online. I have a number of things that she wrote to me. Um, of course, she wrote something beautiful in my yearbook the year before. And then, of course, there's my senior quotes, which uh, literally say in capital letters, Amy, why did you leave me? And it's kind of affected me a lot in, in the years that passed and kind of set the tone uh, for heartache in general, in, uh, in life, of course, and in, uh, relationships, you always have the tendency to feel like things are temporary as soon as things are great. Um, and sadly it didn't stop me from doing the right thing all of my life when I kind of wished at some point it really should have, uh, cause I definitely made a lot of mistakes after that. But then we jump forward 
to 2005. And why this is also tender at the moment for me. In 2005, I had moved to Atlanta, Georgia to have a uh, better chance at a career. And uh, the thing to do back then, well, it's still kind of the thing to do, was uh, try to get work through going to open mics, I guess. And uh, we got on the phone and uh, talked to the owner of Darwin's in Marietta, which was a burger and blues bar. And uh, we were told we need to come down for the open mic and kind of audition. I'm starting, my spirits are starting to perk up a little bit here, so I feel a little bit better. And uh, we did so, went down there. And uh, when we got there, we asked, you know, about getting on stage. And they told us there was a sign-up list and it was already full. That's very common, especially at a popular place. But, uh, you know, we kind of stuck it out and hoped somebody would cancel their chicken out or whatever it may be. And the owner that was there, I went over and introduced myself and told her I was the person that she had spoken with on the phone. And she said, you're getting on stage, right? And I said, they can't fit us in. And uh, she goes, well, you know, let's hope that you get up there. And a uh, couple more songs later, a couple more songs later, I look over her and she looks like she's kind of packing up and getting ready to go. And I'm like, man, we've got... <laughs> And if it's a good 30 minute plus ride over there, then uh, she says, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to be getting out of here, you know? And I was pretty like, come on, like, you know, what's going to happen? We, you know, we, we want you to hear us play and, uh, you know, kind of see if we pass the audition and she was leaving. So, uh, just like, like a scene from a movie, just then the band went on break and uh, everybody went outside to, you know, smoke and get stoned or whatever they do. I have no idea. <laughs> Either way, the band went outside and uh, I did something that was extremely brave and ballsy. And I walked up on stage by myself. I grabbed somebody else's guitar and I just started singing and playing on the microphone. Solo. Like all by me. <laughs> Which is crazy because, I mean, I'm still that brave today. I really am. But at that time, that was a really gutsy move. Because grabbing somebody else's guitar, un unbeknownst to them, is kind of like dancing with their wife or their girlfriend. But I remember the band kind of coming in and looking like, eh, there's not supposed to be any music coming off the stage right now. Who's that? And, you know, standing there with folded arms and I got through the song and then eventually uh, they came up and accompanied me. And then, uh, surprisingly, <laughs> it was too late to even get a gig there. The owner had left, but immediately we made friends. And one of my favorite people that I met that night was John McKnight, fantastic drummer, fantastic singer, and also a guitar player as well. I love multifaceted musicians. I love uh, when they're, you know, so talented. You're like, okay, so what is your main instrument? I just can't figure it out. And John, uh, John was an absolute angel on my shoulder from the, basically that day on. Now, musicians are kind of a different breed. Here's what I'll say. Musicians have kind of an unspoken law. It's like a code. You know, when you get together, you spend as much time as you can hanging out together and appreciating each other's company and catching up on family stuff and career stuff. But then when one or both people have to go the other way, you go the other way. And when you get a chance to get together again, you pick up right where you left off. I really can't think of any of my close musician friends that, you know, kind of do the, Hey, you know, the phone works both ways crap. You know, it's, I know you're going to work hard on your career and I'm over here working on my, my career too. Chances are we either will or won't meet in the middle, but the next time we get an opportunity to be in the middle because we made it happen or what have you, we pick up right where we left off. And uh, John and I were exactly that way. There were times I would stay at his house and there were times we would just talk on the phone. There were times we were playing gigs together. 
where, uh, you know, we did all our talking, you know, kind of under the cover of the windshield. Just the two of us in the van or three of us, whatever it was at that time. And we really bonded a lot. And I thought that, <clears throat> I thought that, uh, he was at that in my life. I, it, it, he was really a, an extremely important person. I didn't really do too well in Atlanta, and we can get into that story in another episode if anybody wants to hear those stories. But uh, I didn't do too well in Atlanta, and when when I did, it was because I had people like that in my corner rooting for me. And then eventually, when I left Atlanta in. Uh, 2006, almost 2007. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going over some of these dates in my mind. Thankfully, no one's corrected me on anything so far in these podcasties. But as I was leaving Atlanta, um, John and I just decided to stay in touch, like I said. And, and uh, I went back to Atlanta in 14 or 15 to do a string of shows. And he and... And and uh, and big red that was my rhythm section, and we had a, again a great time. I stayed at John's house, and we kept each other company, and again talked about music, and kind of commiserated about the industry. Ate great food. Still can't help but think about the uh, you know the dinner at the peach in the pork shop. <laughs> There's so many so many really good memories, and I'm grinning from ear to ear. Uh, and the last time I really had a chance to hang out with him and Big Red, they were actually coming through Buffalo uh, on tour with Chris Duarte. And uh, and we got the chance to all get together and hang out. And we went up to Niagara Falls, and they came over to the house for the day. And you know, we had a good home-cooked meal. And I think the gig was, they had a gig the next day, if I'm not mistaken. And we went to the show and had a great time. The band played and sounded great. Chris sounded great, too. And then after that, John and I had to stay in touch. Uh, I believe that was probably somewhere around 17 or 18. And we stayed in touch on the phone and through social media. And uh, I don't think we ever really got together again. Maybe once, but man, I worked so hard on putting out my last record uh, in 20 that there, there are whole periods months, weeks that I just like, all I did was concentrate on that. And I might've seen him somewhere in there. I'm really not hundred percent sure, but unfortunately, um, I got news. Like I said, late last week that John had taken his own life and, um, You know, nobody, none of the people he introduced me to, none of the people, that friends that we had in common, nobody saw it coming at all, which is really odd because the thing with, with Amy, I guess I could understand maybe that because of what she was going through that she just, she saw no hope, but John had just fought cancer and, and John had just, you know, he had a kind of a string of bad luck, but it's the music industry. I, we all have, you know, you, one minute you're riding high and the next minute you're playing in a bar and grill, you know, and like I said, with the TV over your head and arm's length away from the dartboard where people are playing and throwing. But whatever it was that John got to the end of his got the end of his rope and decided what made him whatever made him decide to do that it's kind of what I wanted to touch on today and I mean anybody can tell you to call 988 and 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 work through it anybody can tell you that and anybody can tell you to please share this post in honor of prevention you know anybody can do that and, you know, I spoke to my cousin, uh, Marty last night, who was one of the people telling me, how come you haven't put out a podcast in a couple of days, you know? And, and I said, I wanted to get the tone right of this thing. I didn't want to be frustrated with the industry or frustrated with, you know, 
anything else in my life. I really wanted to put the, you know, the, the message across that, or the, the tone for that matter, that there's always a chance that tomorrow it completely turns around for you. And, and that's what has got me up every morning of my life. That can be from a career change and love and everything else. It can always change for you tomorrow. You cannot give up. You can't give up. Giving up, whether it's industry, whether it's your job, or just looking at your life going, this is not at all what I had envisioned. You can't give up. You can always make a change if you want. And again, I'm, I'm like Captain Change lately. I had grown stagnant in my career and stagnant in everything that I was doing. And I just shook it all up and, and basically left it all. I looked at my couch and said, that couch is eight years old and sell it. I look, throw it out. And this, throw that out. And get rid of this and get rid of that. And we literally moved to Tennessee with a 26 foot U-Haul and that was it. Everything else we had to buy again, everything else we had to start over with. And you can start over too. And there's going to be hard times if that's what, you know, is is vexing you. And again, we started over and had a taste of our dream and then man, last December we had to we had to put our best friend down. And for my wife and I, that was our only child. And that's another point of dealing with loss. So before we go any farther, again, if you've ever encountered any feelings like that, immediately reach out to the right people. Let people know that that has crossed your mind and that you want to combat that immediately. Dial 988 and get it all out on the table. There's, I know that there's a stigma with therapy. I don't think that that should be there at all. I think that, again, in the era of mental health awareness, whatever it may be, it all needs to be dealt with. Get it all out on the table and get yourself in the right place immediately. But the second part of this takeaway is how it affects everybody around you. I think we all need to be aware of that. How do we deal with that? And again, the topic is dealing with loss. You can't let it go inward. And that starts with, I'm having these feelings, I'm having these emotions, and it goes right through to the people that are around you. The best thing to do, in my opinion, and I'm by no means an expert, is get it all out on the paper. And that's what I do, unfortunately. I'm a songwriter only by that definition. Like I say in the beginning of all these things, I hesitate to call myself a songwriter because I write things to get, write songs to get things off my chest. And I think that that's what you should do. If you're struggling, put it on the paper with whatever it is. Put it on paper, write it out. Make a rhyme. Anybody can do that. But don't deal with these things by yourself. And do not think that you are alone. And do not think that that's the only way. It's not. It's not at all. And from experiencing, experiencing that at 16 years old and being 45 today, I can tell you that it is a permanent scar that I've, uh, I, I said to, uh, I said to my wife last night, I go, it's like a, it's like a kitchen full of cabinets that, you know, that, you know, where they, those things are. And, uh, yeah, some people have glass doors on their cabinets and some people don't, and they have to start opening up cabinets to see, Oh, where is that? You know, I know right where all my stuff is in my cabinets. And if I need to get those things out and dealt with sometimes, I do so. And I think that you should too. Put them on paper. Deal with it. Write it out. Solve it. Talk to somebody. If you need to seek therapy, seek therapy. If you need to talk to a complete stranger, do so. 
And sometimes a stranger's advice is great. I had to stop rolling again. I'm so sorry. This is just really, really hard for me to get through. So this will be my Springer's final thought. <laughs> I, know I always make light of these things in these awkward moments. I apologize. If you were a person who has these daunting feelings that you can't go on, please contact that hotline. Contact the closest person to you and tell them that this is troubling you and get through it with them, with help. And if you are hearing this and there's a person that has crossed your heart, crossed your mind that could be nearing the end of their rope, drop what you're doing and contact them immediately. Tell them you love them. Give them all of your love and all your attention and help them combat their feelings, their mind, and their emotions. We all need to be here together. That's what was planned. That's why we're here. And with that, I hope, I hope with all of my heart that this has somehow helped you. I hope that it's helped me heal. And I hope that it just brings us closer together.